message from Philemon and uh, while you're turning there uh, if, you, if you don't have it in your Bible readily if you can't find it easily uh, look up in the oh thank you yeah. oh you have to slip out yeah oh man I'm sorry see you go uh, but we'll be in touch yes sir thank okay. you very much thank you Larry God bless you uh, y'all take care thank you for everything thank you Larry have a lovely day stay safe Philemon Philemon it's right before Hebrews and so right after Titus. But if you can't find it there, look at your table of contents. And there's a standing offer in our church pretty much all the time. And that is that if you... Okay. That is if you have not uh, been able to... Uh, if you don't know the books of the Bible by heart, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all the way to Revelation from the Old and New Testament, if you'll memorize them for the first time now... If you're like me and you, your mom taught them to you when you were a little kid, uh, you don't count. I'm sorry, your parents will have to reward you. I will not. But if you haven't learned them before, it really help you uh, just with knowing where things are at when when things are mentioned in the Bible or knowing what the books of the Bible are. And so I, if you'll memorize them for the first time, I'll take you to dinner. That's always been a standing offer in our church, or Mrs. Price will take you to dinner if you're a lady. So... Uh, here we are in Philemon, and uh, the second chapter, no, the first chapter tonight. And uh, last week we saw a simple truth in Philemon, and this evening I want to see another one. And I'll just tell you what it is before uh, we read our text tonight. And that is how to use authority. How to use authority. And you know, that's something pretty important, isn't it? Anybody here, here ever seen authority misused? Mm -hmm. yes. Authority misused? And uh, I think well, we all have. We all have. Uh, <laughs> if you are a sibling, there are probably people that would say that you have misused authority. And so maybe, maybe, <coughs> or maybe you know of a sibling that's done that. But we all want to look at it this evening and uh, try, try to be a help. I want to just read verse 13 and verse 19, and then we'll fill in a little bit of information and make a couple of simple points and and I hope it will be a real help for us tonight. Paul said in verse 13, Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. And then verse 19, he said, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self. Besides, how to use authority. We could say how to properly use authority, but I think that's the assumption uh, when we're looking at it from a biblical perspective. So we'll pray. Father, I just ask that tonight that you would help us with our understanding, and Lord, help us with our hearts to desire to have understanding and to be spoken to by you directly. God, we do not take lightly your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're in the midst. And so we recognize this evening that there is a holy presence in this place, to whom all of us, Father, uh, to whom all of us bow, and to whom all of us are subservient, and God, to whose authority we want to be in submission to. Help us to be able to perform that. Tonight we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is, this is just a very, very helpful letter. And we actually looked at a simple message in it last week, and we just uh, looked specifically at the prayer that Paul prayed for Philemon, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Last week we kind of looked a little bit at the things that Paul had to say about Philemon. Uh, things that give you really a sense of who Philemon was in the relationship that he and Paul had. First of all, Philemon was referenced as a fellow laborer. Fellow laborer. And you know, I don't know about you, but if Paul were to call me fellow laborer, that would be really a compliment. Wouldn't it for you? If Paul would say, you and I, I mean, just to say you and I, like, you know, and how many of you would, would like the Apostle Paul to use you in an equals kind of a sentence? You and I. Us too. And he calls Philemon a fellow laborer. There are some things that, without having to read too far into the text, 
that we can infer very easily about Philemon. One, he refers to the church that's in his house and references at other times in here uh, a number of individuals that were part of that church. And so Philemon evidently was not passively involved in his relationship with Jesus Christ. Philemon was a guy that his house was the church. I mean, he opened, he opened his home up to the church. And, you know, a person who is casual about, uh, about being part of the church doesn't open his home up for everybody uh, to worship the church. You could say, well, pastor, that was for him and his servants in his house. You know, they kind of had a us four and no more kind of a church. No, there are references in Philemon of people that were part of this church. He evidently was not even the pastor of the church, it doesn't seem, but he was heavily involved in the ministry. And he uh, was so involved in the ministry that his house, there was a church in his house. That's quite a compliment, I would say, when it comes to Paul calling you a fellow laborer and then, rep or, and then mentioning uh, that you're heavily involved enough that there's a church in your house. He evidently was a man of some means, it seems. He certainly had servants. And he, uh, you know, this man Onesimus uh, had wronged Philemon. We don't know the degree or the extent of which. And by the way, that isn't really the point of Philemon. A couple other things that were notable that we mentioned last week about Philemon as well. Uh, not only was he a man of, uh, not, not only was he a fellow laborer, and, but he was um, a guy that uh, Paul said that he prayed for constantly. Constantly prayed for. Now, does it mean anything to you when someone prays for you? Does it? It does to me. I tell you, when someone prays for me, it means the world to me. I have a number of friends uh, that when they call me on the phone ever so occasionally or, or even often, one of the things that they do is say, can I pray for you real quickly before we get off the phone? And I just really appreciate that. I just tell you, that just means the world to me. And then when I know that someone prays for me, on a continual basis, when somebody, for instance, prays for me every day, there are a few people that I know pray for me daily. Every single day, they pray for me. And, uh, you know, when you really pray for somebody, isn't God, please bless Pastor Price. Help him have a good day. Amen. Think about this. If you were going to pray for me, what would you pray? Well, go ahead and answer it. Wisdom. Wisdom. Pastor, give, give Pastor wisdom for crying out loud. <laughs> we need to, <laughs> to be different than he was last week. Okay, pray for Pastor as he preaches. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Protection. Protect Pastor. Um, you know, it's part of like general prayer is lead us not into temptation. Protect Pastor from evil. Um, what else? God's love, man. Let him know God's love in his life. Yes. Holiness. Holiness. Spirit's power. Be spirit and power. In other words, when you really pray for somebody, you don't say, God, please bless this person. You pray for things that you know they need. And Paul said that he was constantly praying. I think constantly from a guy like Paul means at least daily. But to perhaps more. Perhaps because of the circumstances right at this time with Onesimus being present with Paul, perhaps constantly means, like, I'm praying for you all day every day. I mean, I'm just thinking about you and thinking about this mess with Onesimus and I'm constantly praying for you. And But he specifically said that I'm praying that you um, may be effectual. Praying that you would be effectual or that your faith may become effectual. Now, is Paul here saying your faith is ineffective? Is he saying there's no power in your life? Uh, <clears throat> you're a problem, Philemon. Well, evidently, you know, if you just infer some things, and I could be wrong about this, but my guess is that his runaway servant or slave, Onesimus, knew who Paul was because of Philemon's effectiveness. Think about that. When a guy wants to get right, where does he go? You don't just randomly run into a guy who's imprisoned. You go there on purpose, right? Maybe, I mean, maybe, you know, he was high-ranking enough to have been in prison with Paul, but I seriously doubt a slave would have been prisoner in the same place as Paul. He went to Paul. 
What made him do that? Well, I think Philemon's ministry. I think that Philemon had an effective enough ministry that when Onesimus actually wanted to get right and wanted help, he knew where to go. I'll tell you something, it's an effective ministry. Maybe you yourself uh, can't always help somebody, but when you have enough of a relationship with God that people who know you know where to go, that's pretty effective. We ought to all be that way. You know, you cannot, you're not always going to be the one that can help someone. But if you turn people the right direction, and you're enough of a testimony to people, when they want to get right, they'll know where to go. It's my prayer for a lot of people that aren't doing right. It's like, well, I want them to know where they can come when they get right. And Philemon evidently had done that. I think Philemon was effective. He was a fellow laborer with Paul. He was... Uh, prayed for by Paul on a constant basis. And uh, Paul, though, prayed that he would be effectual in his faith. And the application we learned last week is that we as believers, in order to grow, have to know that there's room for improvement. Of course, here Philemon's a, what we would call a fantastic Christian. I'm not looking at Philemon and saying, well, you lousy guy. No wonder Philemon, well, no wonder Onesimus ran away. No. Philemon had evidently been wronged, but there was room in Philemon's life for him to be more effective, for his faith to be more effective than it currently was. We ought to ask God that question continually. God, is there room for me to be more effectual in my life? Can I be more effective as a believer? Listen. If you won't admit that you could be more effectual, you're probably not very effective at all, actually. You probably have a pretty uh, inflated and inaccurate esteem of where you stand. I just love the way that Paul prays or mentions this to Philemon. But he says with some boldness a couple of things. And when I read this letter, at first I am a little put off at what Paul actually says to Philemon. I think, Paul, you've got quite a bit of nerve. You have, you're pretty brassy to be a willing to say, you know, I'm thinking about keeping Onesimus because you owe me anyway. It's kind of what he said. Look at verse 14, or verse 13. He said, whom I would have retained that in thy, <coughs> that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, but I thought about keeping him so that he could serve me instead of you serving me. Who does Paul think he is? I think Philemon has to be his servant. Who does he think he is? Well, we read in verse 19, Paul said, I, Paul, have written it with thy, mine own hand. I'll repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. I'll tell you who Paul thinks he is. It isn't who he thinks he is, it's who he knows he is. He knows that he's an individual that has invested enough in Philemon's life that Philemon owes him a debt. I suspect, I mean, Paul is here saying, I'll pay financially. If he owes you something, I'll pay for it. I'll cover it. But I suspect that for some reason, uh, Philemon would feel as though he owed a financial debt. Now, I've sat around daydreamed scenarios about what exactly could have happened with Philemon and Paul, that Philemon owes Paul a debt. Ever so occasionally in the ministry, you have the opportunity to maybe save somebody from making really, really, not only costly, but deadly decisions. Sometimes. I can't... It does, they, they, they don't always occur to me but I could probably think of four or five times probably inside of a year when someone calls and says something to the effect of, I'm thinking about taking my life. It happens pretty frequently. I think it's important for preachers to answer their phones. And I've gotten some phone calls at inconvenient times where people have said to me, I'm thinking about taking my life. And normally if you'll just talk to the person and give them a biblical perspective and tell them of Christ's love. It's really that simple. 
But if you'll talk to a person, give them a biblical perspective, and tell them of Christ's love before you get off the phone, they've changed their mind about taking their life. And they'll usually say, thanks for being a friend to me. And you really kind of feel like, I don't even really know you. Really kind of did what you know ought to be done for anybody. But I've had people say, you know what, I'm alive because of you. I'd be dead if it weren't, because, if it weren't for you. And I don't know how many times in ministry that that's been the truth, but a lot, quite a lot. I could probably sit down and just recall scenario after scenario where that's happened for me, and I think probably something like that a lot more. Maybe it's something like that for Paul and Philemon. Maybe literally Philemon was in straits where he is like Solomon, and he just said, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. There's nothing in life. And Paul was the minister of the gospel, and literally was the one who delivered the good news about Jesus Christ to him. And because of that, Philemon's life is 180. It's completely different. Maybe he owes Paul a debt for that reason. It might be a financial thing. It might be a financial thing. Maybe there was a need that Philemon had. I know folks that are relatively wealthy, but there was a time when they had lost everything. And they needed help, and sometimes nobody would help them. Maybe Paul... Maybe Paul just helped him when he was down. I don't know what the scenario was, but Paul has no qualms with mentioning to Philemon, you owe me. You have to know someone pretty well to say something like that, don't you? You ever been good enough friends with people that say, you get lunch today? <laughs> you, you're buying lunch today. I have a good friend, and uh, probably every... looks like pretty often... But not not that often. <laughs> Pretty often he calls. He called me yesterday, the day before yesterday, and said, "Hey, do you want to go to such and so place?" And I said, "Well, who's buying you or me?" You got to know somebody pretty well to say that, don't you? And if you let them buy you lunch, you got to kind of have invested enough that you wouldn't feel badly by letting them buy you lunch. Isn't it true? You know how you could say something. Well, maybe you invested somebody. Maybe you invested financially. Or maybe you really put some time into somebody, or maybe, you know, you really know them. And, it, and that person isn't like, well, the audacity, I can't believe he wants me to buy you. Now, there's some people that are just cheap and presumptuous, and they just take advantage of people. But I'm talking about where you bought lunch enough that it's their turn to buy lunch. You know, and you, you have a relationship, you have a friendship, you have an investment in the person. And you don't have any qualms saying, do this for me because you've done it for them. You know, friendships are sometimes hurt because you've done a lot for somebody and then, man, you need something sometime and you find out they won't do anything for you. That's a one-way road. It's just give, 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 take, take, take on their behalf and then there's no give to it. So when you examine it, when you analyze it from that perspective, you actually realize that Paul evidently had a very, very close relationship with Philemon and had really invested in his life. Whether spiritually or financially, it really is all the same. Investment's an investment in somebody's life. And that is kind of on the surface of what you see here, but there's something deeper and something better than that. Better than that is the question, why did Paul invest in Philemon? <laughs> remember, remember Matumbo baby, Wesley, his banking system. We had a teenager who lived with us for a while, and he he shared with us some financial advice. Advice. He said, "You got a friend, and he needs five bucks. Give him five bucks, and then sometime when you need five bucks, you can get five bucks from him." <laughs> I thought, you know, Matumbo, I've given a lot of five bucks, and it doesn't always come back from that particular friend. But that was his idea. If you got a friend, and he needs five bucks. You give him five bucks, and later when you need five bucks, you get it back. There's just some people you don't get it back from, you know, you realize. Uh, but that isn't why you invest in somebody, so that you can get something back. Do you really think that's what Paul's about here? No. I mean, seriously, you think Paul's about, you know what, I need to get served because, you know, I did something for you and now it's payday, baby. I want to get what I need, you know? No, I don't think so. Do you? No. Why did Paul invest in Philemon? Why did Paul invest in Philemon? Was it so that Philemon would owe him? There are some people like that. I've learned with some folks, don't take anything from them. Because, man, when you take it from them, they, they attach something to it. 
right? And they want, they're going to get something back from it. In other words, they're not going to give anything without getting something. And uh, there could be real subtle and very, very scheming, manipulative in giving. And they don't give anything. They act like they give, but they are actually uh, trying to get something with what they're giving. They're getting, getting, giving so that you're obligated, that you're obligated to give back or something like that. I don't think that's Paul. I don't think this letter makes it into the canon that way, do you? I mean, is this an inspired word of God here? Is this profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? Okay, so Paul isn't saying this is how to get something by giving something. Get somebody to owe you so that you can really get a payback when you really need it. Isn't that at all? What we see here is Paul actually showing an appropriate use of biblical authority. See, Paul was an apostle. He was a foundational gift to the church. He was a first generation church gift. He was a, uh, a very, very limited gift. You had to be called to be an apostle. And Paul was one of the few who were called to be an apostle. And he was recognized as an apostle by the other apostles. And <clears throat> oftentimes when Paul would be attacked about his apostleship because of the uniqueness of his circumstances, the defense of his apostleship oftentimes was first, you are the proof of my ministry. You are. In other words, the change that God has wrought in your life is an evidence that my ministry is real. And that's Philemon here, I think, don't you? Because what God has done in your life is an evidence of my apostleship. So here's Philemon getting this letter from the Apostle Paul. And in the letter, Paul says, I thought about, I'm sending Onesimus back to you with this letter. Well, I thought about just keeping Onesimus because I needed him so that he could serve me instead of you serving me. And Paul's not here saying, you know, you're less than me, you're my servant, that sort of thing. Not at all. Not at all. Paul here is alluding to the reality that in a time when he needs to be served, he is one who is also served. What is apostle? What does Paul call himself? What, what's a, a synonym that the apostles oftentimes use for themselves? You're not going to guess it, but you'll know it when I say it. Minister. He's a minister of the gospel. What's a minister? Servant. It's a servant, right? And I, it certainly is a fact that Paul had served Philemon and had invested in his life and had given to Philemon, had poured himself probably into Philemon, had poured his life and probably even his resources into Philemon in a way that unquestionably Philemon had benefited and probably to some degree owed his life to the Apostle Paul. That certainly seems to be implied in the letter. Friend, What can Paul get back? Or what does Paul ultimately get back here? He alludes to his right to get back servitude. He alludes to his I have the right to have Onesimus serve you, serve me, instead of you serving me. I have the right to be served by you because of what I've done for you. But notice that isn't what he gets back. I thought about it. It wouldn't be wrong for me to ask for it or to take it, but he doesn't. <laughs> Biblical authority properly exercised does not take everything that perhaps you may have the right to. You may have biblical authority. One of the things that you need to learn is that your authority is not for your own benefit. Authority is not for your own benefit. Paul said, I could benefit by it, but he would not and did not. And so it kind of cancels anything you may think about Paul with regard to, wow, Paul's willing to just make Onesimus serve him or Philemon serve him. No, he could have, but he didn't because of the way that Paul exercised his biblical authority. Now here's the question, a practical question. What are two reasons, give me a couple of reasons at least, 
why Paul had authority in Philemon's life. For a couple reasons Paul had authority. How could you write a letter like this without authority behind it? And have any expectation of its being received? For a couple reasons. God had given him authority. He was an apostle who made him apostle. God did. So he had God given authority. In other words, he had the right because of God given authority. And you know, there is in the scripture, there is that type of authority. I remember one time in high school uh, hearing somebody say something, and later I, I analyzed at the time it didn't sound right, and it still doesn't sound quite right, but I remember a teenager saying, I will respect him because of his position, but I will not respect him as a person about an authority. I remember hearing someone, I can think of the specific scenario of it. And you know something? Uh, if authority is God-given, that's the end of it. Right? As far as we're concerned, okay, God-given authority, then we'll submit to it. So Paul had God-given authority. Do you think Paul went everywhere using his apostleship as a way to get people to serve him? Apostle Paul in town. Where's the red carpet? Come on, people. <laughs> I need my $55 million jet. The one I have is way too cheap. <laughs> is that Apostle Paul? Is that how he used his authority? How did Paul use his authority? To serve people, right? But he did have apostolic authority. Why did Philemon owe him, though? Certainly because of his personal investment. So how did Paul use his authority? He was an apostle. How did he use his authority? He used his authority as a servant to invest in Philemon. And he also used his authority a second way. Let's look at it very quickly, will you? In verse 15, Paul said, I wanted you to do this willingly. Notice verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, speaking of Onesimus, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Now notice 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Now yeah, Paul used his authority. He used his authority to benefit Onesimus and Philemon. Isn't that interesting? In other words, he said, he alluded to the reality, I could use my authority to benefit myself. But in practice, Paul actually used his authority to benefit Onesimus. He said, I don't want you to receive Onesimus like a servant. I want you to receive him like a brother like you'd receive me in my stead. And I ask you the practical question, if Philemon received his wayward servant who had wronged him like a brother, do you think that may have been good for Philemon as well? What would be better for Philemon? Okay, I'll take you back. Every time I pass you, though, I'm going to kick you. <laughs> Every time I see you, I'm going to remind you about what you did to me. I'm going to let you be my servant. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to imprison you. I'm not going to this and this and this and this. But uh, just know, you know, we're going back at least to square one, and you're going to have to earn everything with me when it comes to regaining my trust in your position. That isn't the way he received Onesimus back. He received Onesimus back the way he would have received Paul. Might it have done the heart of Philemon good to not have a grudge against Onesimus? Might it have been an example that would have made his faith more effective than it had ever been before if he received Onesimus back as a brother. Give me a percentage. 90% chance? 95% chance? My friend, if 
Paul, and he did, if Paul sent Onesimus back and was obeyed by Philemon the way that he said, there's a 100% chance that Onesimus benefited by it and that Philemon benefited by it. And that's how Paul used his authority for the benefit of those that he had authority with. A lot of times we think about authority, we don't think in those lines, do we? We think in terms of loyalty, and we think in terms of self-benefit. And that's not a biblical use of authority. On the surface, it may seem or appear as though Paul was trying to benefit here. Actually, what Paul is doing is writing a letter which is stern enough and frank enough that Philemon is left with a very, very clear choice of right and wrong. And as a brother who loves the Lord, Paul painted it in such stark clarity that he had really no choice but to do right. And he benefited by it. Invest in people. Invest in people's lives. Understanding that your investment in their life is not so you can benefit. So you can get something out of them. But maybe so that later on they can benefit along with someone else. That's what a minister, a servant of Jesus Christ does. That's the proper use of biblical authority. Father, thank you for the lesson this evening. Help us to retain it and absorb it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.